Georgie, come back. Oh, <gasps> that dog is about as obedient as I am. Like father, like son, huh? <laughs> Don't worry, Darcy here. You're not much better, are you, mate? <laughs> well, obedience for the puppy starts the day they get home. Today's episode, we have lots of tips on how to do it. And we've got a great segment on common ailments that we should all be aware of when choosing a dog. You'll also meet a puppy that flies business class. What? Don't you get any ideas? We sit in the back of the plane. Sit? That's something George needs to learn as well. <laughs> Gotta go find him. All right. George. <laughs> Come on, Darth. <laughs> Bringing home a new puppy can be one of the most exciting things for a family, but it's also one of the most critical times to make sure they're well socialised. Because these guys have an instinctive fear of humans. Not that you know it by this little fellow. So, Trish, why is it so important that we make sure they are well socialised? Yeah, so, um, Lara, puppies have what we call a critical socialisation period, which is generally the first 16 weeks of their life. During that time, the puppy's brain is growing at 80% its adult capacity. And that's, that's quite a big growth in a very short period of time. So puppies need to be exposed to everything during that very, very um, important development period in their life. Um, what puppies experience, whether it's good or bad, is permanently learned during okay. that time. So what are some of the most important things we should expose them to? Absolutely anything, Lara. Just anything that moves and make noise. So wheelchairs, whippersnippers and gardening equipment, mm -hmm. uh, cars, you know, whistles and bangers and clangers and, of course, you know, people as well. So tall people, short people, children, elderly, you know, you name it, you need to expose to. So, of course, we want the experience to be a good one, not a bad one. And so how do we do this safely? We do it quite slowly. So we mm -hmm. would maybe introduce the item slowly, maybe distance in the room or maybe we put the item in the middle of the room, mm -hmm. allow the puppy to investigate, take its time. Um, and of course, you know, positive experiences. So some treats and some games whenever we expose the puppy to new things. And loud noises is a big one. Things like fireworks um, and thunder and lightning. Yeah, absolutely. Later on in life, that can become a problem. So if we expose the puppies to those things early and we make it a good positive experience, that generally they shouldn't have an issue with it later on. And what's the best way to do this? It's not just about taking him to puppy class. That's probably one of the best ways to learn how to do this and most well-run puppy classes will have a socialisation and exposure segment as well where they will teach the owners how to introduce their puppies to different things. Okay, so we just need to make sure they're experienced and they're qualified so that we don't give that negative experience. Absolutely, this is very, very crucial time during the puppy's development so we need to make sure we're doing the right thing. So go and see a qualified trainer. Great, now I tell you what, if you are considering and getting a new puppy, consider adopting one. There are so many rescue groups that have got puppies looking for a new home, like these guys from Hair of the Dog Rescue Group. If you want to find out more about adopting pets, visit the Pooches at Play website. Have you ever wondered why we can't use our own shampoo on our dogs? I'm guessing it's because they've got fur and we've got skin, but I'm no expert. Annika is, so let's ask her. Annika, why can't we use our own shampoo on our dogs? Well, we have different pH levels. So you need to have a shampoo that's designed for the right pH level, otherwise it's going to cause the skin to flake. But the other thing to consider is that you need a hypoallergenic fragrance and a lot of human shampoos wouldn't be designed for, for an animal's skin. Right, and what kind of soaps and chemicals should we look out for? Well, basically, we should avoid soaps and chemicals altogether. Right. Soaps will actually negate the effects of flea treatments and chemicals, actually, it's unnecessary to have things like SLS and paraben and ethoxylate in the washes, which is why Rufus & Coco, we don't include any nasties in the product. And, in fact, they all have a coconut surfactant base and, and that, combined with the other ingredients, leaves a beautiful wash. Fantastic. Now, there's a huge range of shampoos here, all natural. Why so many? because it depends on the needs of you and your dog. So if you have a white dog, you'd be looking for something like the bright white wash to restore the white in the coat. Mm -hmm. Or a black dog actually has dyes that will actually rebuild the colour in the animal's coat. Or you might have fleas. So you might need a wash that contains something like pyrethrins, which will kill the fleas. Itch relief is for itchy dogs. So it's great to kill the fungal infections that often live on the skin. You're OK, little rocket. Then we have oatmeal wash, which is, a, is for sensitive skins, and natural wash. Both of the last two there contain shampoo and conditioner combined. But, of course, if you're trying to avoid water, water-free wash is the way to go. Sprinkle it on and it absorbs the excess oils and leaves your dog smelling really fresh. <laughs> well, there you have it. More shampoos than a Beverly Hills salon. Looks like George is going to be looking very clean and shiny from now on. Thank Thanks very much, Annika. Thank you. Thank you, Rivas and Coco. Dogs who 
have been domesticated by humans for centuries. So most breeds these days have a particular look very specific to their function. Needless to say, most of these are very far removed from their original wolf ancestors. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that with these altered physical characteristics, we are also finding some common conditions prevalent across certain breeds. Whilst not all dogs of a certain breed will experience these conditions, it's vital that owners understand what they may need to be covered for and at what level to ensure that they're covered for any treatment or surgery that may be required. Little pugs like Chance here can be prone to oversized palpebral fissure syndrome. In other words, having excessively large eyelid openings. This can lead to blindness, so it needs to be monitored constantly by your vet. You don't have it though, don't worry. Cavaliers, on the other hand, can be prone to dry eye and also cardiac disease. These can both be treated, but again, they need to be monitored. Staffies can be prone to dermatitis, while Dachshunds with their long backs can suffer from intervertebral disc disease. <laughs> Labradors, like Ronnie here, can be prone to hip and elbow dysplasia as well as ear problems, but yours are looking okay. Yeah. That's why it's important with these and all the other problems we've mentioned to take out an insurance policy as early as possible before any of the symptoms present themselves. What do you think? Yeah. I often refrain from screening them, have you got insurance or not, but it's a deal maker and a deal breaker every single time. In fact, we've got a case in this morning I was dealing with a cat, not a dog, but it's got a seemingly trivial injury. It's got a luxated knee um, and I've been through the options multiple times over two phone calls, very stressed male owner, and they've actually elected to euthanise. One of the options was to amputate, and I said amputation's actually more expensive than fixing it. But they've made a decision to let their cat go. It's a four-year-old cat, everything else is normal. So that's devastating for them, the cat and the veterinary personnel. It's, I mean, I, I know how I feel when I'm put in that position. How do you feel? I'm a bit of a sucker for a deal, so often I will offer them a discounted surgery. I mean, a lot of surgeons do that, um, come to the party, so to speak. Uh, you know, that, that I would euthanise less than 10 animals a year in that predicament. That's fortunate, but it's, it's, this is not why you went to vet school to train, to no. euthanise animals that can be fixed. I mean, it's, it's a fixable problem. The, the, the surgical solution is not the barrier. It's the client's finances and also, in this particular case, fear of things, post-surgical complications. They're, they're not only budgeting for the fixed cost of the surgery, but what else might go wrong if it doesn't work? So they almost need a built-in plan B. Obviously insurance is the, is the answer to all this. That's why it's so important to understand your dog's breed and to make sure that you have the right level of coverage that they may need throughout their life. I'm here with Debbie and Pebbles. Now Pebbles is, hang on, is it Rottweiler or Rottweiler? Rottweiler, we say. But there's something special about yes. Pebbles, the Rottweiler. Yes, this Pebbles here is a long-haired Rottweiler. Long-haired Rottweiler. Yes. Now, I haven't heard of them before. No. What's, that, what's the story behind um, that? It's actually a recessive gene. The mother and father have to have the gene for it to come out. And where does it come from? Um, well, originally, the Burmese mountain dog was bred into them to get the long hair. Right. She's from a litter of 10, and there was three out of the 10 that had the long hair. Can you find one by design or is it no, just potluck? just potluck really. And when you yeah. picked Pebbles up from her litter, what, was it apparent then? At four weeks when I went to see her, I um, had no idea. She just looked the same as the others. So the night before I picked her up, I saw it, they'd sent me a photo and I went, oh my goodness, that's not a Rottweiler. <laughs> um, so I picked her up and yeah, anyway, took her home. She was just covered in fluff. She's and they sort of said, oh, no, all that fluff will come off, but it never did. No, it just got curlier and more beautiful. Yeah, she's a very good girl. And it's good because a lot of people will come up and say, oh, what, what is she crossed with? And I go, well, actually, she's a long-haired Rottweiler. It does make them a lot more approachable, I It think, does, it does. So people get to realise they're not, yeah, they're not yeah. that bad. Lovely to meet you and Debbie, and I'll keep an eye out for your long, lustrous hair next time I'm in the area. Yeah. Thanks right. very much. Thank you. Are you going to say goodbye? Sit. Say bye. Sit. <laughs> bye. 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 <laughs> Food plays a major role in the health and well-being of our dogs, just like it does for us. 
Yet whilst we can make our own food choices, our dogs rely on us to make the right one for them. And this can be confusing. But fortunately, I found Chris and hopefully he can help. Chris, let's start with the big dog story. Yeah, so I studied a uh, food science course at uni. Upon completion of that, I was in the small goods business for around seven years, okay. uh, working through different levels there, like QA officer and manager and operations roles. But um, it first started really when I was in a pet store and I was talking to a gentleman behind the counter and he was, we were talking about our dogs and our raw do. foods. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, um, and he asked a little bit about my background and uh, when I was speaking to him about that, he said, you know, we're looking for somebody like you. Um, there's, this, there's been books written about a raw food diet and with different ingredients and that, but you can't buy it. So um, I had a bit of a look into, into what he was talking about and um, there's certainly a niche market yes. and it made sense to me, it was all natural. Mm. And um, I've always had pets all my life and it, it just worked for me. So I put my hand up for it and uh, we, we started a little mini factory um, because all the machinery was very similar to the mm. small goods mm. uh, machinery that we used and, and even the formulating and that sort of stuff, you know, I understood all that from my, um, my food science background. So that made things a little bit easier. But um, yeah, we got the ball rolling there and we were the first to bring it out in Australia. And, um, you know, this category's just grown from there, really. And a big part of your story is the fact that you are Australian made. I mean, a lot of people are looking for quality Australian made food for their dogs. Yeah, absolutely. So Australian owned own business, um, but all of our raw materials are, are from local farmers. We always mm -hmm. try to buy as local as, as possible, um, but certainly all of our raw materials uh, are from some Australian business. And you grow your own wheatgrass and barley on site? Yeah, we have that little operation there um, at the back where we can grow about two and a half tonne of that product a week. So from seed to harvesting, mm. it's um, about a five day turnaround mm. and um, nutritional from, from utilising that sort of raw materials. Mm. It's fantastic. So all that sort of goes into our, our food as well. And what was it that made you go down the raw path? Well, it just it was common sense to me when I, I was reading the books and uh, and just having a look at, you know, everything, you know, the processed foods that are on the shelves and then there's this raw philosophy in it. And I said it, it's just a common sense approach to me and, and really what we're doing here is mimicking a wild dog's diet. So. Mm. It just made sense, whereas you know all these other processed diets and that they just they just didn't. So, so I mean, I thought there was a niche. There certainly was, and um, and it's fantastic. You know, this category is growing. We're getting a lot, a lot of healthier pets out there now. Well, it makes sense. We know that an unprocessed diet is better for us, so why not for our canine friends? If you'd like to find out more about the Big Dog Diet, then visit their website. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. I'm here with Melissa and her Maltese schnauzer, the real Pippa Smith. So Melissa, Pippa is an experienced flyer. She's quite the seasoned traveller, I understand. Yes, she absolutely is. Um, over the years, she's over 11 years old and she's been on more than 400 flights, which is quite significant. 400 flights, so I understand she flies business internationally? She does, um, she loves business. It, it sort of gives her a bit of space, a bit of room to- uh, She gets her own seat. She absolutely does. <laughs> so celebrities normally rub shoulders with other celebrities. I understand Pippa's got some friends in first class lounges that she likes to hang out with? Yes, um, Ali Golding, who's an international pop sensation. Very walked, famous. Very, very famous. She walked up to us in LAX First Class Lounge and asked if she could take a seat with us. And within seconds, she's taking selfies with Pip and then posting them on her Instagram account. And literally, a couple of minutes later, 100,000 people liked it, so. Pippa Smith, everyone, a seasoned international traveler and quite the classy one, too. Thank you very much, Pippa. Can I have a kiss, please? Okay. Thanks very much, Melissa. We'll see you later. There's a few tips to remember when booking pet-friendly accommodation. It could be the difference between a great family holiday or a ruined trip away that's memorable for all the wrong reasons. Come on, mate. Even the most obedient of poachers can be tempted to take a look around the new neighbourhood when they're away from home. So choosing a place with an enclosed yard is a must for truly pet safe holidays. Just as a secure yard is a good idea for holiday accommodation, if you're staying in a multi-level, make sure the balconies are safe and secure. It's not just kids who need the safety of a pool gate. So check that any pool or spa areas are fenced or prevent access to these areas by keeping your dog indoors or in other yard areas where they can't get in. Some places may say they are pet friendly, but then stipulate that the dog is kept outside at all times. 
always check the rules before you go and if in doubt, check with the accommodation owner. This place is so friendly, they've even given us some doggy treats. They look pretty tasty, don't they, George? There's no point in taking your dog on holiday if they can't get out and about and enjoy the sights with you. Find local off-leash parks, beaches or pet-friendly dining so your dog can enjoy its holiday too and not have to stay cooped up in an unfamiliar house. Fortunately, Take Your Pet has taken the hard work out of booking pet-friendly accommodation for you. So visit takeyourpet.com.au for great places to stay, like here at the Azua Beach Retreat in Rye and other Ocean Blue Coastal Retreats featured on their website. If you're heading to the Mornington Peninsula, then check out Cool Art Studios. It's the perfect place to stay while you explore the bayside and ocean beaches, hinterlands, villages and wineries of the area with your pampered pooch by your side. You can relax, refresh and unwind, sitting on your private patio or recline in front of the fire. Each unit has a king-size bed with ensuite, kitchen, dining, lounge room with air conditioning, internet and foxtel. But something tells me you'll be spending more time outdoors than in. For those planning an escape in Western Australia, Diamond Forest Farm Stays is both family and pet friendly. Centrally located between Pemberton and Manjimup in the beautiful southern forests. Amongst the selection of accommodation styles, there's two pet friendly cottages with secure attached yards for your dog's safety. Daily animal feeding, canoeing, fishing, a games room and a playground mean there's no shortage of things to keep you entertained. There's over 100 animals. Add your fairy friend to the mix and you've practically got a zoo. Back in Victoria, we have another rural experience for you and your dog at South Mockinger Farm Cottages. Enjoy the privacy and quiet of farm life at their historic 4,000 acre sheep farm at the southern edge of the Grampians National Park, just three hours from Melbourne. Historic Stonycroft Cottage has a cosy open fire, sunny veranda and a very large secure yard for your best friend. This cottage sleeps four in two bedrooms, or you can ask your mates along and spread out into the Shearer's quarters for a total of 24. You'll be surrounded by majestic 600-year-old red gums and spectacular scenery to invite you for country walks. For more pet-friendly accommodation ideas, visit the Take Your Pet website. <coughs> An anxious dog can be a concern for many dog owners and whilst we can't solve all the problems here today, we can perhaps look at some ways that we can treat this. Now Robert, are there certain breeds or is it what we do to dogs that makes them anxious? Well, there is a genetic susceptibility to anxiety. Mm -hmm. So we've got the three things to consider. There's the genetics, yes. the threshold, are we low anxiety or are we, are we very resistant to anxiety? Okay. And then there's the um, learning that can go on. Mm -hmm. Have things produced anxiety beforehand? Yes. And then, of course, we've got to think about what's happening here and now. Mm. But I think the overriding thing to realise is that anxiety is actually natural. Okay. It's normal. Mm -hmm. And without it, we'd be dead. <laughs> So, but what we're interested in, of course, is when it gets out of hand. Yes. Say with separation anxiety exactly. or dogs being aggressive to other unfamiliar dogs, mm. that is, and, uh, and, or unfamiliar people. And in those cases, we think, well, th this has just got to the stage where the welfare of the dog, mm -hmm. maybe the person that's attacking or even the carer of the dog is, right. is at stake here. And often we look at little breeds like little Pippa here who, I mean, she's pretty sturdy, but some of the smaller breeds and that can, you know, be left alone and they get quite anxious. Um, is, that our, is that our fault? Some breeds have a reputation for it, mm. but what we've got to also understand is that within a breed, there's a huge amount of variation. In fact, there's good scientific evidence to show that a lot of the breed's so-called specific stuff is not true. Okay. No, they have a reputation for it. Yes. Maybe they're more likely to do it, mm -hmm. but an individual member of the breed is not necessarily okay. going to represent that breed standard. It is such a big issue. Obviously, it um, it's the big issue. I think. It yeah. is. It is. It, it concerns a lot of people. So we can't, as I said, you know, address it all here. But is there a role for toys, like keeping them mentally? I mean, particularly people. You know, they like to keep their mind stimulated. Mm -hmm. How can toys? Let's see how she goes with these. Help. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess, you know, something like this. Can we help? Keep well, it's, it's, it's something which engages their mind and focuses their mind. Of course, it's going to take their mind off the anxiety. Mm. And there's good evidence, for instance, in people that if you're physically active, yes. you feel more relaxed. Absolutely. And therefore you're more resilient to the things that might cause you anxiety. Mm. So a big thing, let me look, she's sort of interacting here now. There we go. Yes. And particularly with some of these breeds that, you know, are considered smarter and stuff, mm. it's mm. it's good to keep them stimulated, isn't it? Well, some of them, of course, need a huge amount of stimulation. Mm. Like, well, take the Border Collie, for instance, yes. as a, a dog with a reputation, you know, that they are driven, some of them. And without it, they 
get into all sorts of strife. Yeah, well, absolutely. embarrassing their owners and, <laughs> <laughs> and causing problems to cyclists and things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. So these interactive toys are a great way of sort of addressing big or small dogs, really, aren't they? Well, yes. Within the 24-hour period, there's a, a place for the toys at home, mm -hmm. say in the backyard, inside the house, but also getting out and, and checking out their environment. Mm -hmm. It's rather like getting on the web and Googling, you know, just <laughs> seeing what's around. So there are a few things that we can do to help our dogs that might be suffering from anxiety. If you'd like some further information about the topic, visit the Pooches at Play website. Thank you, Robert. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks to our friends at HIF, one lucky viewer is going to win an amazing Pampered Pooch weekend escape. All you have to do is share a creative photo on Instagram showing your pooch being pampered, along with the hashtag HIF Pampered Pooch, and tell us in 25 words or less why your dog deserves a pampered weekend escape. The prize includes accommodation for a family of four and your pooch to a pet-friendly accommodation provider in your home state to the value of $800. Plus, you'll get a Pampered Pooch wash and groom service worth up to $150. There's also five daily prize packs being given away every day over the next two weeks, containing a Rufus & Coco water-free wash and a cool HIF pet LED dog lead. For full terms and conditions, visit the Pooches at Play website. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for this week. Hope you got your fix of doggy cuteness and also learnt some things along the way. I sure did. Make sure you tune in next week for more tips on how to make your life with your pooch more enjoyable. And don't forget to check out the Pooches at Play website for more information on all things dogs. Now, should we see if these two have learned anything today? Learned anything? I gave up teaching George new things a long time ago. <laughs>